Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we are going to be diving into the history and engineering of Polaroid instant cameras. The way these things work both in terms of mechanics or electronics and chemical engineering is absolutely fascinating and I thought it was high time that I had a closer look at them. Now before we get started just a few things to note. First because there's so much ground to cover here this will be a three-part video series with each part covering a different era of Polaroid's technical development. So in part one, we are going to be looking at the very earliest days of Polaroid from its foundation in the early 1930s to launch of its first instant camera in the late 1940s to the launch of its most successful product of all time in the mid 1960s, what we might call the roll film era. In part two, we're going to be staying in the 60s and looking at the two major developments of that era, which are pack film and color instant film. And finally, in part three, we'll be covering the period from the early 1970s when Polaroid introduced its most iconic product, the SX70 camera and integral film, which is what most of us think of when we think of Polaroid cameras, all the way to the company's bankruptcy and dissolution in the early 2000s. So the second thing to note is that the Polaroid company in its original form operated for over 60 years and it produced hundreds of different products with countless variations between them, which I could not hope to cover in their entirety, even in a three part video series. And so instead, what we're going to be doing is focusing on two examples of cameras from each of the three eras that we're going to be covering. So if I don't cover a particular model or a particular event in the company's history, that's by design. This is intended to be a technical overview rather than a company history or a collector's guide. Anyways, with that out of the way, let's get started. So we've actually covered briefly the early history of Polaroid in one of my previous videos, the one on Iceland Spar and the discovery of light polarization. So Polaroid was founded by an American inventor named Edwin H. Land, who was born in 1909 in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So he studied physics, specifically optics, at Harvard University, and actually ended up dropping out not once, but twice, the first time in 1927 and the second time in 1932. And the second time was because in 1929 he had developed and patented a synthetic light polarizing film, which he called Polaroid. And this consisted of iodoquinine sulfate suspended in clear celluloid plastic. So Land teamed up with his Harvard physics professor, George Wheelwright III, to found Land Wheelwright Laboratories, which in 1937 was renamed to Polaroid. And the pair set out to find commercial applications for Polaroid film. And after a number of false starts, including early 3D movie systems and headlights that were polarized to reduce glare on the road, they hit upon a number of truly successful products, including polarized sunglasses and camera filters. And their timing couldn't have been better because after the United States joined the Second World War in 1941, Polaroid was contracted by the U.S. government to make all sorts of products for the war effort, including polarized sunglasses and goggles for airmen, a stereo system for aerial photographs called the Vectograph, uh, gun sights, camera filters, all sorts of things. And these wartime contracts helped Polaroid grow into a major corporation post-war. Now, according to Land, the inspiration for the company's most famous product came in 1943 when he and his family were on vacation. One day when we were vacationing in Santa Fe in 1943, my daughter, Jennifer, who was then three, asked me why she could not see the picture I had just taken of her. As I walked around the charming town, I undertook the task of solving the puzzle she had set for me. Within the hour, the film and the physical chemistry had become so clear that I hurried to the place where a friend was staying to describe to him in detail a dry camera which would give a picture immediately after exposure. Four years later, we demonstrated the working system to the Optical Society of America. So that demonstration took place in February 1947, and just shy of two years later, on November 26, 1948, the day after Thanksgiving, the first Polaroid Land Instant Camera, the Model 95, went on sale at Boston's Jordan Marsh Department Store for $89.75, or around $1,200 today. And the company hoped to sell its first batch of 56 cameras by Christmas, but as it turned out, all 56 were snapped up in the very first day. These proved extremely popular and demand soon outstripped supply and the company was actually forced to ration its supply of cameras until it could get its production line ramped up. 
Now I actually have an authentic Model 95 camera here, but before we have a look at that, let's talk about the chemistry of the most important part of the whole Polaroid system the instant film. So in my previous videos on home photo development kits, I've talked about the basic chemistry of black and white photography. So in brief, traditional black and white photographic emulsion is based on silver halides, which when they are struck by light, decompose into metallic silver crystals. And this creates a very faint pattern known as the latent image. So when you want to develop an image, you put the film into a bath of developer solution, which promotes the growth of those crystals, causing the latent image to become ever denser and clearer. Now, once the image has been sufficiently developed, you then put it into a stop bath, which halts the development reaction, and then into a fixer, which washes away the unexposed silver halide, leaving only the metallic silver behind. Now, of course, this is a negative image where bright areas are represented by darker concentrations of silver crystals. So in order to produce a positive image, you then need to print this negative onto another piece of photosensitive paper. So in the first Polaroid instant film, you actually had two film strips joined together. On one side was the negative layer, which was exposed to light in the camera. Now, the other side was a receiving layer, which included little pods full of developing and reagent chemicals. And these were hydroquinone, potassium thiosulfate, and potassium hydroxide. And so once you took a photo, you would pull the film out through a set of rollers that would pop that pod and spread the reagent between the negative and the receiving layers. So what would happen now is as the hydroquinone started developing the negative image, the potassium thiosulfate, which was normally used as a fixer, would solubilize, it would dissolve the unexposed silver halide and cause it to start diffusing over and be deposited onto the receiving layer. So after a certain amount of time, around 60 seconds, though this depended on the type of film and the temperature, you would peel the two layers apart to reveal the positive image that would diffused over and deposited itself on the receiving layer. You would then throw away the negative layer along with all of its developing chemicals and keep the positive. So the earliest Polaroid land cameras actually produced sepia-toned images. And this is because Polaroid wasn't initially able to produce a sufficiently stable black and white emulsion. Now, they did eventually release a black and white film in 1950, but the user, after developing the image, had to paint it over with a special clear coating film in order to stop it from degrading. And this would be common practice until 1970 when Polaroid finally cracked the secret of a truly stable black and white emulsion. Right, so let's actually have a look at two cameras from this era in greater detail. Right, so this is the Polaroid Land Model 95, the very first instant camera released in 1948. And this is an absolutely beautiful example. It even came with its original carrying case and all of its accessories, including a flash gun, light meter, flash bulbs, batteries, everything. Just a great, great find. So like all of the early Polaroid cameras, this is a folding bellows style camera. So how you deploy this is you press this latch on the front, this door opens up, and then you pull out the lens unit along this track until it clicks into place. And then on the top or side of the camera, depending on how you're using it, you can fold up your viewfinder. So to load this camera, you flip over this little latch on the side here, and that releases the rear cover. There is an outer cover and an inner cover. And you'll notice that there are two wells in here for film. So unlike in a regular camera where you'd put your film roll in one side and pull the film over to a receiving spool on the other, early Polaroid roll film actually had two rolls, one for the negative layer and the other for the receiving layer and those little reagent pods. And so you would drop one in one, one in the other, and then you would pull the end of the joined film strip over to one side through the rollers inside the lid. You'd close the inner cover, close the outer cover, and then pull the film strip out through this slot in the side. And this hinged piece right here is a film cutter, which allowed you to cut off each photograph as it came out of the camera. Now, in terms of controls, we actually don't have a lot going on here. The camera is focused by sliding the lens unit back and forth along this track. On the left-hand side of the lens unit, we have a dial here, and this adjusts shutter speed and aperture simultaneously. We have a jack in the front for attaching a flash gun. And then on the other side, we have a little switch that toggles between I and B. 
So I stands for instant, and this is the regular setting where when you hit the shutter release, the shutter opens and closes automatically according to the shutter speed setting, whereas B stands for bulb, and this is for long exposure. So when it's set to B, when you hold down the shutter release, it's going to stay open for as long as you hold it down, and then when you release it, the shutter closes. Now, once you've taken your picture, what you did was you press this film release button on the back, and then you pulled out the film through the side, pushed down the cutter, and tore it off. Now, that wasn't actually your picture. That was the negative layer from the previous picture that you took. But now what you've done is you've pulled the film that you've just exposed through the rollers, layering it together with the receiving layer and all the reagent chemicals. And this is now inside the camera in the process of developing. And so you would wait for around 60 seconds. Again, this depended on the type of film and the temperature. But once the development process was complete, you would push to the side this little latch, open up the outer cover, and your photo would be there. And you just have to peel off the receiving layer to reveal your finished photograph. And that is how the very first instant camera worked. Now, in 1963, Polaroid would introduce something called pack film, where instead of having the two parts of the film on separate rolls, these would be layered together in a rectangular pack that you could load as a unit, and this allowed you to pull out each individual film element one at a time as they were exposed. But we're going to save that for the next video. Instead, we're going to skip forward a bit to 1965, when Polaroid introduced what would prove to be a radical and highly successful product. And that was this, the Model 20 Swinger. You'll notice that this looks very different from all the cameras that Polaroid had previously produced. It is a non-folding plastic bodied camera, and it really looks more like a toy than a proper camera. And really, that was the point. Polaroid wanted to expand beyond the traditional market for professional and hobbyist photographers and get their products into the hands of ordinary people. And they did this in a number of ways. First was through the design of the camera itself. This was actually designed by legendary industrial designer Henry Dreyfus, and he intended this to look like a toy, an object of fun rather than a professional photographic instrument. Uh, they also lowered the price down significantly. This originally retailed for $19.95, which today would be around $183, and this was calculated to be affordable by about 70% of the families in the United States. They also tried to sell this in non-traditional venues, so drugstores, gift shops at vacation destinations like ski lodges and beaches and campgrounds, and they also heavily advertised in youth magazines in an attempt to associate this with fun and leisure uh, rather than just ordinary photography. And according to legend, the name Swinger was coined by copywriter Phyllis Robinson of the advertising firm Doyle Dane Burnback when she saw Edwin Land walk into the office with the camera swinging from its wrist strap. And this eventually inspired an advertising campaign featuring a catchy jingle called Meet the Swinger, sung by Barry Manilow. Hey, meet the swinger, all right, swinger, meet the swinger, all right, swinger. And this proved extraordinarily successful. The Swinger would go on to become Polaroid's best-selling single product of all time and one of the most popular cameras in history. And it helped increase Polaroid's market share for personal cameras from only 11% in 1964 to over 35% in 1966. So there were three main models of the Swinger produced. There was the ordinary Model 20, which took roll film. There was the M15 Sentinel, which omitted the built-in flash gun, and the Model 3000 Big Swinger, which took pack film. So let's actually have a closer look at this Model 20 and see how it works. So the loading process for the Swinger is very similar to that for the Model 95. You swing up this latch on the back and open up the rear cover, and you'll see that you have two wells for your two film rolls. So you drop those in, and then take the joined end of the film and pass it through the rollers at the end so that the film comes out the side of the camera. Now, something else you'll notice in the camera interior is this cover on the floor, which if you lift it up, you will see there is a battery compartment. And this powers both the flash gun and the exposure system, which for my money is the most technically interesting part of this entire camera. So the exposure system on this is a variation on the extinction light meter, where you place 
progressively darker filters over your viewfinder until you find the darkest one that still allows light to pass. In this case, however, what the camera is doing is comparing the light from your scene to a light bulb of known brightness. So how you use this is you look through the bottom window on the viewfinder and you will see a red and black checkerboard pattern. You then pinch the shutter release and twist it back and forth. And what you will see is the word yes appear in this grid. And when that yes is at its clearest, that means that your exposure is correctly set and you are able to take a picture. Now, if you're using the flash gun for a picture indoors, you would instead use this little window above the lens, which shows you the range to your subject. And other than that, there aren't really a lot of other controls on this camera. The viewfinder, other than the exposure meter window, is very basic. We have a fixed focus lens. We have our flash gun here, which takes miniature flash bulbs, and there is a lever on the side for ejecting the bulbs once they are spent. And finally, we have our mechanical shutter release, which works by simply pressing it down. Now, once the photo is taken, you would press this blue button at the back to release the film. You would pull it out and tear it off. And unlike in the Model 95, the film develops outside the camera. So after around 60 seconds or however long it might be, you then peel the film apart to reveal your final image. And that is how the Model 20 Swinger works. Now that's all I have for you for this episode of this series. I'll see you next time in part two, where we'll have a look at the two major Polaroid developments of the 1960s, pack film and instant color film. Until then, Thank you so much for watching. I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.